Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Goslin. Um, I work in marketing at DQ. I've asked my good uh, friend and colleague, Glenda, to help um, walk me through some of the updates um, and what to expect for WCAG 2.1. So, Glenda, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Awesome. Um, so, my name is Glenda the Goodwitch Sims, and I work at DQ, where I lead a fantastic group of accessibility experts. And I'm also currently on the W3C's Accessibility Guidelines Working Group, helping to craft the next version of WCAG, WCAG 2.1. So what do you think, Glenda, what do you think WCAG 2.1 will cover? What's a high-level overview of what to expect? So I think the first thing that we need to remind people is that WCAG 2.1 is an effort to fill known gaps within WCAG 2.0 and that WCAG 2.0 is still fully in play. And the known gaps, the major areas of known gaps are in low vision and mobile and cognitive. Why is this so? Because WCAG 2.0 was published in 2008, and I don't know if you remember what your mobile device looked back, like back then, but a lot of us didn't have these big screen devices. So a lot of things have changed in mobile, so it makes sense that we didn't have that covered. Um, and low vision and cognitive, while they have a little bit in WCAG 2.0, um, there's some significant barriers that still exist that we need to meet for both of those disability types. So those are the primary areas of focus uh, in WCAG 2.1. So what's the timeline I can expect for WCAG 2.1 moving forward? Um, just to let you know how much work has gone into WCAG 2.1, research for WCAG 2.1 probably goes back even as far as 2008. So we're, we're picking up things that didn't make into WCAG 2.0. So lots of research for a long time. And extremely active work has been going on for WCAG 2.1 since uh, January of 2017. We've had a draft release of the guidelines almost every month since January uh, 2017. And as we approach uh, fall, um, we are, our latest draft was published on September 19th, 2017. So that's the draft that's out there right now. And I'm anticipating two more drafts. Um, a November 15th is likely to be the last working draft because I'm expecting in mid-December a, um, a candidate recommendation. And a candidate recommendation actually is still a draft, but it's a much more stable draft. Uh, so mid-December for a final, final draft, as early as summer of 2018, this WCAG 2.1 standard could become an international standard and recommendation. And while people always wonder, uh, deadlines, are you meeting them? Um, I will tell you that since January of 2017, WCAG 2.1 has been on time and on schedule. So I really anticipate we could have this new standard finalized and published uh, in summer of 2018. Great. So knowing this timeline, does it make sense for someone like me to start using WCAG 2.1? Great question, and what I would suggest is it depends on how you're coming at it. Um, if you're trying to apply it in a, oh my gosh, I have to meet this legal requirement, then not quite yet. I would definitely wait until after the December uh, candidate recommendation gets published because it's going to be stable and almost finalized, but the other perspective is every single one of these items that are even in the September release of the draft are already best practices for accessibility. 
So if you care about accessibility and you're trying to make accessible websites, you can begin to apply these principles and criteria immediately. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is if you want to have an impact on what WCAG 2.1 looks like, what it includes and what it doesn't include, um, go read it right now because the acceptance of public comments um, at some point will close as they start to finalize it. So you don't have a lot more time. Uh, so real critical if you want to have an impact in making changes. So is WCAG 2.1 backward compatible to the WCAG 2.0 that I currently know? It absolutely is. Um, there's no conflict between the two. That was one of the requirements as we wrote it. Um, and it, they really are complementary. And so you can go ahead and apply WCAG 2.0, and then you would add 2.1 on top of that. They are additional requirements. So will WCAG 2.1 continue using the A, the AA, and the AAA standards? Absolutely. Yes, because it's uh, complementary to WCAG 2.0, it uses that same structure and the AAA, AAA um, model is still in place. So what you're already familiar with will just have additional SC um, that fall in line at the WCAG 2.1 level. If I want to contribute to this working draft, what are some requirements for writing good success criteria for WCAG 2.1? You know, it's funny, up until uh, 2017, I had never tried to write a uh, success criterion. Mm -hmm. I'd only used them, applied them, and tested for them or taught to them. Um, writing one of these is so hard. Um, and it's the, the kind of thing that we have to recognize that to write a good standard that could become an international legal requirement, it must be something that human beings can test reliably. It has to uh, be implementable. Like it has to be possible to meet the criterion. And we also wanna make sure that each one of these success criterion are technology agnostic because today uh, while we may talk about HTML and native mobile apps and digital documents who knows what kind of digital wonders are in our future so we need to stay up at a level that we call a condition we need to document the success criterion requirement as a condition and not loop it in too tightly to HTML or a native mobile language so that it too will Will stand the test of time. And um, uh, the other thing that we consider without a doubt is if there's, there's three pulls on this and it is what are the accessibility needs of people with disabilities and what's technically possible to do today and also what is reasonable? We have to look at the cost benefit of doing it. So really high bar in writing these. And while it's the hardest work I think I've ever done, it's also been the most intellectually stimulating. That's great to hear. Um, so besides you, who is writing this uh, WCA 2.1? You know, some of the best brains in the world are involved in this. And what's super exciting to me is that the W3C is a completely open and transparent organization. So from the get-go, WCAG 2.1 has been written in a way that you could publicly watch it. All the minutes of all the meetings are public. Um, every draft is public, all our comments and questions to each other, all public, to the point that um, WCAG 2.1 is being created out on GitHub, and you can go to that location, 
read it and make comments yourself. So who's involved in creating this? A number of people that have been involved in creating accessibility in the past, but also wide open doors to developers, designers, people with disabilities, lawyers, you name it, everybody's welcome. So if I was curious about how um, this WCAG 2.1 was being made, would I be able to watch that process? Yes, you definitely can. Um, there is a, a process in place that the W3C has made very um, clear lines of how something moves from an idea into a working draft, into a candidate recommendation, into a formal, this is final. And that process is documented out at the W3C um, and everything is published as we move along. Um, so completely open. The only piece that's not completely open is actual, if you were to attend, there are uh, right now twice weekly phone calls mm -hmm. where about I don't know, probably about 80 people are invited. Um, and those are not open. Um, the minutes from them are open. Uh, you can't attend those without being an official member of the working group. Got it. Okay. So my last question is, what's the W3's process for um, publishing these quality technical requirements? Yeah, so um, the absolute requirements are there must be a first public working draft that is available for wide review, early and wide review. It's not appropriate for us to be creating an international standard and say, mm, I'm going to publish the working draft on Thursday and we'll finalize it on Friday. Uh-uh. You know, this thing will have been out there a, over a year and a half uh, so that people really have that opportunity to um, give feedback, review it, think on it, see if it's implementable. And then between the first public working draft and what we call a candidate recommendation, there can be as many public working drafts as needed. There may be none. You can have a first public working draft and you can go straight to, we think this is ready for an official vote. But in this case, um, we will have had, I don't know, over five um, working drafts that have been out there for review before we go to candidate recommendation. After candidate recommendation, that's a very formal stage and I'm expecting that in mid-December. Uh, we will have a formal vote within the membership of the W3C. Is this ready to be considered for full recommendation? Uh, so a very formal vote will take place and then there will still be a time period for public comment between candidate recommendation and um, the final in which could be as early as summer of 2018. Um, there can still be changes, but it should be stable enough that those changes are minor. Great. Well, thank you so much for helping me dissect um, the process around WCAG 2.1 and what to expect. I really appreciate it, Glenda. You bet, Laura. Looking forward to more conversations.